We've been talking about what will happen on planet Earth, and boy, we've gone from everything to the rapture, uh, tribulation period, Armageddon, second coming of Christ. Um, but the real question that causes Jewish people a lot of consternation in accepting Yeshua as the Messiah is the fact that they believe the Messiah will bring world peace. And they often say to me, well, Jesus didn't bring world peace. And my answer to that is just wait. He's going to bring peace to this planet. And I'm going to take you to a passage in Isaiah, if you'll take your Bibles, please, chapter 9. And we're going to look at just two verses. The whole context here is phenomenal. Uh, I would love to uh, take a couple of hours with you on the context of Isaiah. Chapter 6 begins, in the year the king Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up. In chapter 7, most of you know about uh, verse 14, the Lord will give you a sign. He told Ahaz, you asked for a sign, but that wicked guy would not do it. God said, well, then I'll give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son. Thou shalt call his name Emmanuel. Well, then from that point on through chapter 9, we have, interestingly, a lot of verses that people, when they read this, don't realize are quoted in the New Testament. Uh, for example, at the beginning of chapter 9, it says, Nevertheless, the dimness shall not be such as was in her vexation, when at the first he lightly afflicted the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, and afterward did more grievously afflict her by the way of the sea beyond Jordan in Galilee of the nations. You say, what in the world? It would be a good verse to memorize, wouldn't it? The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them hath the light shine. Well, that's actually a messianic prophecy. Uh, I'm kind of, uh, well, some of you already know this from the radio broadcast, but I have great interest in uh, Jewish writings regarding our Bibles, of course, in the Old Testament. Sometimes I find that they are more loyal to the inerrancy and inspiration of the Word than many of our Gentile commentators are. Of course, they're wrong on the biggest issue of all, who the Messiah is, the identity of the Mashiach. Uh, I found interesting things in both the Targum and Midrash and the Talmud. They speak of the Messiah in 62 separate verses in the book of Isaiah alone. Have you ever anybody told you about the 300 verses that point to the 300 passages to the first coming of Messiah. You've heard that said, 300 prophecies. About. Well, you know, it's interesting. In the Jewish writings, they have 554. So we missed about 254 of them. And it's really remarkable when you begin to understand how they looked at the Bible. The Targum says of this passage, the Messiah has been forever and there's no doubt that this is about him. In Isaiah 9, 1 and 2 that I just read, it speaks of a light that shines upon the nations who walk in the darkness. That was quoted in Matthew 4, 13 to 16, and refers to Yeshua. But interestingly, the rabbinical writers before the time of Yeshua said that the light is the Messiah himself. Remember in John 8, 12, our Lord said, I am the light of the world, and he who follows me will not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Well, there are two verses that um, are just absolutely fascinating. In fact, you probably have heard them so many times, especially around Christmas, they appear on a lot of cards. And I'd like to take some time and tell you about them because my Lord is going to bring peace to this planet once and for all. So let's read them, just two verses, see if we can analyze it. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, 
And the government shall be upon his shoulder, shall be upon her, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David, upon his kingdom, to order it and establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts, which, Jonathan, you sang about it several times. The zeal of the Lord of hosts, Sabaoth, will perform this. Will you join me, please, in a moment of prayer? Father, we pray that in this closing ses session of our conference, you will help us to understand that world peace, which the world often talks about but does nothing to help, will one day come through the presence and power of the King of kings and Lord of lords, our blessed Lord Yeshua. I pray for those that are listening right now who are still not sure of their relationship with you through your Son, our blessed Messiah. God, I pray that will change today as we read clearly in two simple verses the majesty and glory of his character and what he will do in the future. Thank you, Lord, for what you're going to do. In the blessed name of our Lord Yeshua, we pray. Amen. You might find this interesting that this past year uh, I spoke to the largest Jewish synagogue in America. People have asked me, well, why in the world did you do that? Well, if they ask, it's not my fault. And, uh, but uh, to show you how big it is, uh, there were 12,000 people there. Uh, a lot of the people wondered what I was doing there. They have about 10 rabbis on the staff, and the head guy is named Feinstein. So I began by saying, by any chance, do you have a relative in the Congress? Now, you're Canadian, so you probably didn't catch that. But the senator from California is Diane Feinstein. Well, that made him quite upset. He said, no, 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 not her. So that told me all I needed to know about that political problem. <laughs> but he had asked me to explain my view. Why do you love Israel so much? And he knows about Jewish blood in my family. And uh, he, he said, you know, we have a lot of people here who listen to your broadcast. I said, really? I said, well, that shows their great wisdom, doesn't it? <laughs> and he smiled and he said, uh, well, what are you going to talk about? I said, what do you think I'm going to talk about? Well, he said, I think you're going to talk about Israel, but I have a feeling you're going to sneak in Yeshua among your talk. I said, well, I want to correct you on that, Rabbi. I'm not going to sneak it in. I'm going to boldly tell you about him today. He said, okay, I want to know. We all want to know. He said, the first question every Jew wants to know is, who is a Jew? And we fight over that all the time. I said, well, that's a problem among Christians, too. They're not sure who a Jew is either. In fact, some of the guys are playing Jew who are Gentiles, and they don't know either. But the truth is, he who is a Jew is one inwardly, according to a very Orthodox Jew. And uh, it's not in the flesh, not being circumcised. Uh, circumcised avails nothing. Anyway, he said, they're very patiently listening to me and he said, well, we'll talk about that another time. I said, okay. And he said, well, what passage are you going to use in the uh, Tanakh? I said, I'm going to use Isaiah 9, 6 and 7. And all he did is put his hand up to his brow and said, oh, no. <laughs> I said, the first thing I want to ask you, Rabbi, before I get out there and speak to your people, is, is it your belief that Isaiah 9, 6 and 7 is about the true Messiah of Israel. He said, funny you put it that way. I don't have to believe in Yeshua to answer you. No, you don't. I just want you to tell me, do those two verses speak about the Messiah of Israel who will bring peace to this world? He said, absolutely. I said, that's all I need. 
because I was really hungry. <laughs> and then when they finally gave me something to eat afterwards, just a little olive and cheese and cracker, I thought, boy, you got 12,000 people, you could afford a big steak, couldn't you? Uh, anyway. So I want to talk to you about how we're going to have peace on the earth. The cry of every prophecy conference, the cry of everybody around the world, and all those people in that Miss Universe contest. It's almost amusing. They come up, what do you want to do in life? Oh, world peace. World peace. Don't even know what they're talking about. So let me tell you that the Messiah is the only one that will bring peace. As a matter of fact, I know a lot of you are troubled about a lot of things. Just in these couple of days, I've heard some tragic stories in our midst. Some of you are really hurting. Some of you have serious family problems. And you need peace. I'm here to tell you that the peace you're looking for even now comes through the Messiah of Israel. He can put peace in your heart. And one of the great desires we have as teachers, Bible teachers in this conference, is that every one of you knows what it means to have peace with God. But there's also a peace of God that will keep your hearts and minds through our blessed Lord. And there's going to be world peace. Peace is coming. But it's going to come through the Messiah of Israel. So let's just see if we can analyze this passage as to how that's going to happen and why. I want to start with the fact that his presence will identify him with humanity. Isn't it interesting how this starts? Look at your Bible. For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. Now the word for that begins verse 6, and I don't want to bore you with too many details from grammar, but this one I think is kind of important. The word for in the Hebrew text is connecting the context by teaching there's great rejoicing among God's people because God has broken the yoke of oppression and the weapons and garments of the warrior are destroyed and the basic reason for all of these blessings is that a special child is born. In contrast to Assyria and the Syrian Northern Israel Coalition, it will be a child that will bring deliverance to God's people. In the Targum of Isaiah, we read these words from our Jewish friends. He will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God. Let's face it, He lives forever. It is the Messiah who alone in His days can peace really come. I like that. A couple of things here struck me. One was His remarkable birth. A child is born. Flip back to Isaiah 7, please, and look at verse 14. In Isaiah 7, verse 14, it says, Therefore, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God is with us. Now, you probably heard the controversy over the word virgin. I don't want to bore you with it. There are three Hebrew words that could be used, but Alma is the one you're going to use if it's a young woman of marriageable age, and if the intention would be a virgin. Does Alma mean virgin? No. Its classic usage is a young woman of marriageable age. But I remind you that this verse is quoted in Matthew chapter 1. And in Matthew chapter 1, the original text is Greek, not Hebrew. And it says, A virgin shall conceive, and it's the Greek word parthenos, which can only mean virgin. My Jewish friends then quickly say, well, that's Gentile mythology. Uh, you're trying to say the Messiah is God, not just an extraordinary human personality. No, I'm not trying to say it. I am saying it. The Messiah is God. But about your argument, I said, I want to ask you a question since there are six translations 
of the Old Testament in Greek, that is from Hebrew to Greek, before the time of Yeshua, what did these translations put in Isaiah 7.14 as the Greek word for Alma? And my rabbinical friends always say, well, uh, yeah, I, well, uh, yes. Uh, hey, you're stumbling a bit. What was it? It was Parthenos. They didn't have the New Testament. Yeshua wasn't around to tell them that Alma, the virgin of Isaiah 7.14, met Parthenos. But here these men who translated the Hebrew into Greek used Parthenos. So it means that those men, before the time of Jesus, actually knew that the point of it was a virgin will conceive. How interesting. A remarkable birth, to say the least. The second thing I notice here is a special relationship to the Father. You say, how do you know that? It says that unto us a son is born, a child is born, and unto us a son is given. Luke tells us that in chapter 1, verse 31 to 33. We all know John 3, 16 tells us that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. The son, interestingly, was given, not born, implying pre-existence. He is the eternal son of God. You say, well, if it's only begotten, then he must have had a start. No. Uh, the New International tried to help us when it said one and only one. It's a unique word. Why? Well, when John uses it five times, he uses it of our Lord. But there is one issue in Hebrews chapter 11 where Abraham's son Isaac is called his only begotten son. Well, he wasn't the only son he had. He had Ishmael by Hagar and also sons by Keturah, whom he married after the death of Sarah. But why was Isaac an only begotten son? Because he was unique in his relationship because it was through him that the Messiah would come. In Isaac shall thy seed be called. They also tell me in Jewish literature that the first phrase is birth and the second one is adoption. I find that extremely interesting. Whether you believe it's right or not is beside the point. We know that Jews who do study the language have a feeling about this phrase that opens a verse that it's speaking about both birth and adoption. I just want to remind you that Joseph never had sex with Mary until Jesus came out of the womb of Mary. Did Joseph ever have sex with her? Yes, he certainly did. I'm sorry if you have Catholic background, but yes, he did. For our Lord had stepbrothers and sisters. The Bible says so. Catholic Church tried to cover that up, says, oh, they're just cousins. No, they weren't. No, they're brothers and sisters, stepbrothers and sisters. Well, Joseph was in the line of King Solomon. And many of my Jewish friends say, well, wait a minute, if he is born of a virgin, then he couldn't be the direct descendant who is the heir to the throne of David. I said, on second thought, maybe you want to just think that through again. If he is adopted, then he's a legal heir to the throne. If you read Matthew 1, you have the genealogy of Yosef, of Joseph. But if you read Luke 3, you have the genealogy of Miriam or Mary. The fact is that Mary is from his son Nathan, Nathan. And so was he born of David, King David? Yes, he was. If you mean coming out of the womb of a woman in the line of King David through his son of Nathan, absolutely. Then when Joseph marries Mary, he adopts him and he now becomes a legal heir to the throne through David's son Solomon, which is the kingly line. My friends, in Isaiah 9, 6, we have all the answer we need. Unto us a child was born, and unto us a son was given. Psalm 132 says the Messiah must come out of the womb of a woman in David's line. Well, he did. And then we got all kinds of religious people telling us, well, then the woman must be the mother of God. No, she is not the mother of God. People say, well, what part of the genetics made Jesus God? 
None of them. The Bible does not say that Mary's egg was fertilized. This heresy continues in the church of Jesus Christ. And it's about time we throw it in the trash can and end this. No, my friends, the Bible says he was conceived by the Holy Spirit of God. If you have 23 chromosomes and a fertilized egg of Mary, the result is always female, not male. So guess again. No, a child was born and a son was given. And right away his presence in, in humanity, as it were, is identifying who he really is. Let's look at a second matter. His position will identify him with sovereignty. It says, and the government, not a government, the government, definite article in Hebrews in front of it. The government will be upon his shoulder, the shoulder, the place of carrying burdens. Isaiah 22, verse 23, the key of, of the house of David will I lay upon his shoulder so he shall open and none shall shut and he will shut and none shall open and I'll fasten him as a nail in a sure place and he shall be for a glorious throne to his father's house. Yes, his position identifies him with sovereignty. The government of the entire world will be on his shoulder. Here's the good news if you're an American. There'll be no more czars. Some of you Canadians know about that. We got a bunch of people called czars. We never voted for them. They were just appointed by the president. And some of the weirdest, wackiest, wickedest people you have ever seen are among all these czars, and we're paying for them. I just want you to know there's not going to be any cabinet, and there will be no Congress. Jesus is going to be calling all the shots. He's going to be making all the decisions, and he will rule with justice and equity forevermore. You won't need to worry about <laughs> things being right, for every decision of his will be right. Righteousness is his, is his loins. And truth will constantly be evident to everybody as he will rule King of kings and Lord of lords. But here's one of my favorite. The third thing is that his person, who he really is, identifies him with deity. As I went over this, uh, my rabbinical friend said afterwards, he said that was the most amazing analysis of the Messiah I have ever heard. He said, you know, on the basis of what Isaiah 6 uh, says, uh, chapter 9, verse 6, he said, I think we have to believe that the Messiah will be God. Really? Let me show you what I showed him, just to see. Number one, oh, first of all, when it says, his name shall be called. I love that song by Audrey Meyer. His name is wonderful. His name is wonderful. That's based on this passage. Isn't it interesting the word name is not a title? It never appears in the plural in reference to God. 800 times in the Old Testament, Shem in Hebrew, Anama in the New Testament over 200 times. It refers to nature and abilities and attributes, not a title. There's a little book in a Christian bookstore that says the names of Jesus. Well, he only has one name. And that name refers to who he is. When we talk about the name of God, Moses said, I need to know who you are. I'm not going on anymore until you tell me. You know what he said to him? You remember. He said, I am that I am. I would say offhand, that's not a whole lot of information. Anybody ask you, you just tell them, I am sent you. you got to be kidding me. No. Uh -uh. You know, the Bible says the one who was and is and is. You remember that? It's interesting that the Tetragrammaton, four Hebrew letters that are the sacred name of God, are used in past, present, and future grammatical forms. It's really basically the word to be. 
So he is the one who was and who is and who is to come, the eternal God. What a wonderful thing. The name is not his title. It refers to who he is. We try to pronounce it and say Yahweh or Yahweh, Yahweh. But uh, a lot of people say Jehovah, which comes from the Latin. And because of its connection with a lot of cults, I don't like it. So don't use it around my presence. The King James tries to tell you how important it is. It's the only translation in English that makes the word Lord, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, when it's Yahweh, the Tetragrammaton. But when it is Adonai, an earthly Lord, it's capital L in small letters, O-R-D. Interesting. His name will be called what? Well, let me show you. First, he is incomprehensible. Amen? What does that mean? It means you can't comprehend him. You will never understand God. Aren't you glad he's revealed a lot in his word? Otherwise, we'd be lost. It's called Wonderful Counselor. Do you remember Judges 13? When the angel of the Lord appears to Manoah, what's your name? Why do you ask, seeing it is wonderful? Isaiah 28, 29 tells us he is wonderful in counsel and knowledge. My friends, in English, wonderful means terrific or fantastic, but not in Hebrew. The word means too difficult to understand. Remember Psalm 139? Such knowledge that God has of us is too wonderful for me. Once again, too difficult to understand. You know, God knows what I'm going to say, and, and this is the way my mind thinks. I'm going to stop right now and see if you can finish it. You know, that's how you can think. It's awfully stupid. He knows every word that's going to come out of my mouth. Makes me nervous at times. But I'm asking the Lord, Lord, help me to say what needs to be said. And so often we preachers make mistakes. We don't check something out. We say something that's really not quite true. And uh, God is certainly gracious. Is he not pastors in the audience? He is gracious and kind and merciful to all of us. But my friends, he's incomprehensible. Interesting, as a counselor... He knows everything about us. There is nothing he doesn't know. He tells us that our hearts are deceitful above all things and desperately wicked and says, who can know it? And he answers the question by saying, I know it. I know the thoughts and the reins of the heart. I know everything you're thinking. I know your deepest longings and desires. I know all about it. We need to come to the Lord for counsel. Amen? I, I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. Come to the Lord for counsel and there's zero silence? Come on. I just saved you lots of money. People are spending a lot of money going to these secular counselors. Listen, if there's no Bible there, get out of there. Don't pay them a dime. The Word of God is our counsel. And the Bible speaks about the counsel and comfort of the Scriptures. Well, he is incomprehensible. Number two, he is invincible. Why? Interesting that it would call him the mighty God. Hebrew is El Gabor. Uh, also used, if you want to look at it, in Isaiah 10, 21. The point is, he is the mighty warrior. Who? The Messiah. The one who walked the hills of Galilee and the streets of Jerusalem. Yes, him. He is El Gabor. He is invincible. Don't ever try to take him on. By the way, the Antichrist is going to try, and he's going to lose that battle badly. You don't make war with the Lamb of God. Amen. I, I often think in Revelation it uses, uh, I think Dr. Heinsohn said 28 times. I don't know. I, I counted 27. But anyway, who wants to quibble over one time? But... Uh, it calls Jesus the lamb. That's got to be an attack lamb. Amen? He's also the lion of the tribe of Judah, but keeps talking about the lamb and what he's going to do. He's invincible. Here's another thing. He is incorruptible. I sat down with a group of rabbis and discussed this with them. The Hebrew word yad implies duration or that which is unending. 
Uh, the phrase, I was told by my rabbinical friends, can be answered in two ways. One, the father of eternity, or the one who is eternally a father. And I looked at them all, I said, you, you do know that I was talking about Yeshua. Yeah, we do. Well, what do you say now? They say, we don't understand this. How can Yeshua be called the father of eternity? Oh, <laughs> you know, it's interesting. The Bible even tells us he controls it. All the ages of time. Yeshua? Yes, Yeshua. Are you sure? Is this what most Christians believe? No, it's not, but they should. You mean to tell me that Yeshua, the Messiah, is the Father? No, no. there is a Father and there is a Son. But He is a Father, and He's a Father, if you choose your first phrase, of eternity, which means He's the source and manager of it all. You see, it's His story. That's what history's about. Or you said, He's the one who's eternally a Father. I like that too. Actually, choose whichever one you want. But we're talking about the incorruptible God who endures forever. He never stops. He is forever. Praise God. Amen? We're not done yet. He is incomparable. And they said, what do you mean by that? I said, there's no one like him. In what sense? He's called the Prince of Peace, Sar El Shalom. In John 14, 27, he said, peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you, watch this, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. How about Ephesians 2.14? He is our peace. He has broken down the middle wall of partition between Jew and Gentile, both a literal wall in the temple as well as a legal wall dealing with ordinances. And Colossians 1.20 said he made peace through the blood of his cross. I say praise the Lord. You can have peace with God when you are justified by faith. You are declared righteous by your faith in what he has already done. And that wonderful Prince of Peace will put peace in your heart even in difficult times. Philippians 4, 6 says, Be anxious for nothing in the old King James. The Greek word is to divide or distract. Don't be distracted about anything. It means when you get your eyes off of who he really is, you can really get bent out of shape, filled with stress. But when you remember who he is, he says, Don't. Don't worry about anything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God, and the peace of God will keep your hearts and minds through Jesus Christ our Lord. Anybody here need peace? He'll give you peace. Wow. Which brings me to the fourth point, that his peace will identify him with royalty. It says in this passage, as we keep reading, of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end upon the throne of David, upon his kingdom, to order it, to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth, even forever. Let me tell you three quick things about that. One, the duration of his government and peace. There shall be no end. Check out Daniel 2.44, says the exact same thing. And as to his physical descent from King David, it's upon the throne of David. And also as to the decisions that he will make, they will be with judgment and with justice. Write down Isaiah 11, 1 to 5. What wonderful words about the root, the branch of Jesse, the son of David. Number five, his power will identify him with majesty. I love that song by Jack Hayford, majesty, worship his majesty. Unto Jesus be all glory, honor, and praise. Amen? 
I want you to leave this conference with your heart centered on who he really is. The answer to all of our problems and prophecy is Jesus Christ our Lord. His power, it says, the zeal of the Lord of hosts, the Lord of armies, will perform this. I decided to check it out and did a little study before I came. I'm going to make it generally so you'd have to do your own. But the term Lord of hosts is used 245 times in the Old Testament. I could easily just take that off of the computer program and mention it and go on. But no, uh uh-uh. I can't leave it alone. i got to know each one of them. Fifty-four of them were in Isaiah. Seventy-one of them in Jeremiah. Fifty-three of them in Zechariah. And twenty-four of them were in Malachi, the Italian prophet. A total of 202 out of the 245 usages are in those four prophetical books alone. I can't end this without telling you what I found. Number one, I found clearly that the Lord of hosts is the Redeemer. I found also in Isaiah 48 too, He is the God of Israel. I found in Isaiah 54, 5, He is the Holy One of Israel. I found in Isaiah 124, He is the Mighty One of Israel. In Jeremiah 32, 18 and 19, He is the Great, the Mighty God. And in Psalm 24, 7 to 10, He is the King of Glory. King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And He's my Savior. What is the matter with us? The Bible is replete with information on who the Messiah really is. Who is going to bring peace to this world? What's well, nobody in office in Canada or the United States or Europe or anywhere else. It's the coming King of Kings and Lord of Lords. One more thing. Well, I actually have a few more things, but one more thing. In Revelation, I thought about it as I was listening to that great message by... Dr. Rice. In Revelation 19, verse 16, it says of the Messiah when he comes, on his vesture and on his thigh is the name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. I was sitting in Greek class in Revelation. It was near the end of the semester, of course. And we came to that in chapter 19. And I raised my hand to ask the teacher a question. He said, yes. I said, I notice that even in the Greek we're we're using, that the text is kind of indented, and the letters in, in Greek are huge. He said, yes, those are unctuals, not minuscule. I said, but I can't find that example anywhere, at least in this immediate context. I said, I'm just wondering, out of all the manuscripts that we have in the book of Revelation, do they all do this? He said, well, I'll tell you tomorrow. I I have to look it up. So he came back tomorrow and he said, I want to thank you for asking that question, David. I said, why? We don't have many manuscripts in Revelation, about 250. And we don't have many manuscripts on chapter 19. But he said, every one I looked at had those large unctual letters in them. I don't know what English Bible you have, and I haven't looked at all of them as to whether they all do it, but they all should. We're talking the theme of the Bible. We're talking what the whole Bible is all about. We're talking about what is the greatest thing in our horizon, the most marvelous thing that could happen in our future, the King of kings and the Lord of lords is coming back. 
and every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The question isn't will you, the question is when do you want to do it? You do it now and become born again by your faith in the Lord through the power of the Holy Spirit. But you don't do it now, I'll tell you, one day you are going to do it even as an unbeliever. For everyone and everything in this universe will fall down before the Messiah of Israel and say, He is my Lord to the glory of God the Father. It's the will of the Father. It's what God the Father wants of us to worship His Son forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. Where's the hallelujah chorus when a man needs it? Amen. I want to end with this. I was preaching on <laughs> Revelation to 2,000 people on a midweek service and uh, I was looking at that text in Revelation 19 when it begins with all heaven. Hallelujah, the Lord God Almighty reigns. So I went up to the sound room ahead of time and I got a little CD of the uh, London Philharmonic Orchestra and uh, the Westminster Choir, 500 strong, singing the Hallelujah Chorus. And I gave it to the boys upstairs, and I said, Now, when I get to that place in the Bible, uh, the, your clue, I'm going to raise my hand in the sky. And he said, I said, I want you to turn that on and put it into distort. You know, make every sound man want to go home to be with the Lord. Just make it as loud as you can. So here I am preaching along. And come to that, and here's what they said. Hallelujah! That thing came on. Folks, I wish to this day I had had a video camera of the audience. They all jumped up. They were moving around, running. They didn't know where to go. It looked like they thought we were getting a bus up for heaven right then. Two elderly ladies fell down on the floor. We almost killed them. The next time you read that, when you're all alone, let the praise of your heart explode. He's my king. He's my Lord. And no one deserves to be mentioned in the same breath with him. He is the only one who can bring peace. He's the theme of our conference. It doesn't matter what portion of prophecy we're studying. He is the subject of prophecy. And may we never forget it. May we go home in our hearts with a new worship and a love for our blessed Lord, King of kings and Lord of lords. Will you join me, please, in a closing prayer?